the shooting range. In this episode, Panzerkampfwagen 1, the origins of the German tank industry after World War I. Westland Whirlwind, a story of a grotesque British fighter. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with, let's fly a little bit and look at the Douglas F3D1 Sky Knight. Let's take a moment and have an episode without French tanks in it, right? We've got a lot of other cool tech in the game. Today, we look at the new American jet, the F3D1 Sky Knight. And you might say, come on, there are loads of other jets in War Thunder just like this one. A whole 12 of them in the same US tree. And you'll be wrong, because this deck-based interceptor jet is rather special. It doesn't look very fast. In fact, you'll rarely get past 650 kph, which isn't very comforting at the BR 8.0. But hold your horses. Stick with us here. Sure, it can't chase any of its opponents, but it can outmaneuver anyone. Let all those sabers chase their prey. Your job is to clinch with the enemy and get him into your aiming cross. Your plane is amazing at maneuvers at any speed. You've also got four 20mm AN M3 cannons to shoot from. As for the bombs and non-guided missiles, we recommend taking the heavy presence there are, 2,000 pound bombs. You drop them all at once. So that way you'll definitely get someone. Also, your speed will only serve as an advantage when it comes to bombing targets, as it will be easier to aim. Just don't forget to dodge the anti-aircraft gunfire. So, how do you fly this thing? Usually, your first spawn will be mid-air. This will help you not to lose your teammates that are faster than you, though you won't get to the top altitudes faster than everyone else either. With that in mind, you need to decide if you're taking the extra payload. You've got no bomb hatch, so all those bombs and missiles under your wings will significantly affect your speed and maneuverability performance. Then you have two options. If you took the bombs, put them in use immediately. There are loads of bases, bridges and other targets that just can't wait to meet your two-ton presence. If you decide to fly light, take your position in the support echelon and lure anyone who gets past your teammates into a dogfight. Try sticking to a 2 km altitude. Above that, you'll have problems with speed and below that, with maneuverability. SB fans will also love the carefully designed two-seater cockpit with good visibility. We've talked a lot about the origins of the French tanks. It's time to look at the dawn of the German tank industry after the First World War. The Panzer I light tanks are often called just training vehicles. Allegedly, they were used in the field only because there was nothing better. But that's not entirely true. The Panzer I, from the start, was designed as a battle tank. It was a child of its time. In the early 30s, they were building light tanks with machine guns and anti-bullet armor all over the world. Even by the beginning of World War II, the most mass-produced British tank was the Mark VI, with machine guns and armor of 14 mm. The 37 mm French weapon had lesser piercing rate than a heavy caliber Browning. Among these machines, the Panzer I didn't look weak at all. But during the Spanish Civil War, the Germans had realized that this type of tank was going to become obsolete very soon. The Panzer I couldn't survive any anti-tank gun hit, and its machine guns proved to be useless against the T-26. So they'd immediately stopped the production line, and the ones that were already assembled were repurposed. After all, these are the Germans we're talking about. They wouldn't allow 
just throwing anything into the bin, right? Those panzers had a sectional hull, as well as a lot of other German tanks of the time. That is why it was no problem in reforming them into some training cabriolet and SPGs. Though the Panzer I modification, A, wasn't very suitable for an SPG role, it had a short chassis and a low-powered truck engine. In 1941, 24 of those tanks had their turrets swapped for 20mm cannons. Those vehicles were named as the Flakpanzer I and turned out to be pretty weak anti-aircraft machines. On the other hand, the Panzer I Modification B had a longer and more stable chassis and the engine was almost twice as powerful as in the Modification A. During 1940, they decided to create light tank destroyers based exactly on this vehicle. Pretty logical decision, as the 37mm German gun was useless against the French Char B1 with its 60mm of armor. Damn, we still managed to squeeze them in, didn't we? Anyway, the 88mm guns would be alright for the task if not for their weight and size. The happy medium were the 47mm Czech guns. So, they used them on the Panzer I chassis and gave them a very simple and short name. Well, <laughs> this one. No surprise that anywhere outside the actual documents, they were called the Panzerjäger I. These machines served well during battles against the French and in the USSR. Right after that, they decided to install 150mm infantry cannon on the same Panzer I. Yeah, you heard it right. 150mm, very heavy, but also extremely powerful and effective. The Alket company decided to do it the easier way. They removed the upper part of the hull, reinforced the fenders, and used a wheeled carriage to get the gun right on them. Then they simply covered the whole thing with armor plates. It was a nice solution for a removable gun, but it was extremely big and heavy, so the chassis could break at any second. Anyway, the Germans were fine with that and called it... Oh, come on, how did they do this? Well, people with human tongues called it the Sturmpanzer I. It also fought in France and in the USSR, though the success was only partial. The 150mm howitzer could demolish a building with a single shot, but this SPG's profile was so high that it was the first target of any enemy, and the overloaded chassis were breaking very often, even though they usually took the weapon down and hooked it in the rear part of the tank when they needed to move. You wanted some aircraft stories? You've got them. The story of this aircraft is like a classic English comedy. None of the participants actually laugh, but the story itself can't be discussed with solemn faces. It's the year 1935. The British Air Ministry orders the manufacturers to come up with a project for a heavy air defense fighter armed with cannons. Nobody actually cared that there were no aircraft cannons in the whole of Britain, not even in the form of a paper project. The aircraft configuration somehow didn't make it to the terms of reference, so the fantasy of the British aircraft designers went completely wild. Some of the projects from that competition can still give nightmares to an unprepared viewer. The only decent solutions were presented by Sidney Cam of Hawker and Reginald Mitchell of Supermarine, but they didn't win the competition, mainly because they were too busy with other contracts, and the order went to a small company called Westland and their whirlwind project. It was created using some very unconventional methods. Its chief designer, William Teddy Petter, never created a single fighter in his life. He was also known to be the worst blueprint draftsman in the whole of British air industry. On the other hand, he was one of the best in the configuration and weight reduction of an aircraft, which didn't make any of his engineers' lives easier. A lot of technical solutions on the whirlwind were almost absurd, but nevertheless, they somehow worked. In the end, 
The aircraft, created out of Petter's weird drawings and their verbal recommendations, looked like something that would fall apart in a couple of seconds. When the prototype left the hangar, one of the Royal Air Force representatives crossly said that this won't ever even take off, and kind of mocking his words, the plane jumped and went airborne. During the speed maneuvering tests, all the pilot could do was speed up and gain altitude. From down on the ground, its creators and the military representatives watched this miracle of an engineer's work with dark faces. They suddenly started having some doubts about the bright future of this project. And they were right. But the problem wasn't in the aircraft. It was with Rolls-Royce and their engines. In the specifications, they had recommended the use of the 12-litre Peregrine engine. But after production had already started, Rolls-Royce ceased its production and focused on the 27-litre Merlin engines that were too heavy for the whirlwind. Petter was so obsessed with compact layout of his plane that changing engines would lead to creating a completely new aircraft. Nevertheless, about a hundred of those machines made it to the Royal Air Force. Now it was the turn of the German pilots to laugh and then realize there's nothing funny. The very first Luftwaffe pilot who dared to meet the whirlwind on a frontal attack quickly started looking like a crow hitting a brick wall at full speed. In addition to the whirlwind's own qualities, Britain finally started producing licensed 20mm Hispano air cannons, and this aircraft got the whole four of these. The only way to beat this fighter was to outmaneuver it in a dogfight, and theoretically it was possible <laughs> For a Spitfire. But the existing problems of the plane couldn't be fixed. The engines couldn't be repaired, as Rolls-Royce didn't make them anymore. There was no place for an AI radar, which meant no night missions. They managed to repurpose it as a strike aircraft, but it didn't have the range to fly over the English Channel. It was a good aircraft, but it had no room for modernization at all. So, by the end of 1943, they started replacing it with Typhoons, Bowfighters, and mosquitoes. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question comes from a player called Z71 Transporter. Should we expect the Xbox One X version of the game sometime this year or at some other later date? Sorry mate, can't give you an ETA yet. But know this, we're working really hard on this version and it's shaping up fine. Then there is a question from Heoran Zia. God, I hope we pronounce that right. Do you plan on doing a history part of the ME-410? Yep, why not? It's a fascinating plane. A player called Messerschmitt of Hart writes, Do you have any plans to implement more planes to the German faction? You have not implemented German planes for a long time. Hi mate, judging by your name, you take this matter very seriously, and so do we. The German tree is far from complete, so keep your eyes peeled. Another popular question came from Rulo6000. Hey Gaijin, just curious, what happened to World War Mode? Hey there, there's actually nothing wrong with it. We're constantly working on it, and it's doing all right. We're also preparing for another round of closed testing. Don't miss it. And the last extremely serious message sounds like this. Can you read my name? Uh, sure thing, Jer, uh, Jern, uh, Jerny Lopnik, we guess. Still, better than the names of those German tanks, right? That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range.